Okay. Uh, yeah. The way the bucket, the bucket is structured, that it's effectively. So, uh, okay. two topics for uh, the it's the meeting on December six. I'm going to turn it over to Nicolo. Uh, yes, I'm bringing here um, these two topics from plenary last week. Uh, I would like to start with the third re-exports one, uh, mostly because I I need Mark to be there for the other topic. Uh, well, technically for both, but for the deferred exports, yeah. and I believe watching well, the record. Deferred exports, would be I, I can represent Mark, I think. Uh, the package okay. name the, and version two. Yes. Uh, I see Dan wrote that somebody needs to mute. Is it coming from my mic? Because there is another person speaking uploads, here. Or is it already yeah, I think it's actually in, in your room. Hello. Okay, then I will turn off the camera and go from the bathroom because I'm in a hotel room right now. So. <laughs> and such are the perils of being a traveling, speaking. <laughs> okay, hopefully this is better now. Uh, so, yeah, uh, for those who were not uh, attending plenary, uh, I presented an extension to the deferred imports proposal that adds some some syntax to exports to still defer some loading of the initial like to improve start of the times and maybe I can even share uh, the slides to quickly reintroduce that topic. Let me just pick them up. And the reason I'm bringing that topic to this meeting now is to like analyze how it interacts with the virus with uh, like the model virtualization. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, hold on, try. Yeah, unfortunately I cannot make it full screen. Uh, because then screen sharing breaks. So the deferred importation proposal adds some syntax that's this uh, that allows well, deferring execution of the module until when the module is used. So all this code in form styles.js uh, is not executed initially, uh, but it's executed when we access one of the exports from, from button. Uh, and like the motivation for this proposal is that we don't need to execute this code uh, at startup, so we can like improve uh, startup performance by deferring it. And I was looking to other places where we execute unnecessary code. And one of them is when it comes to files containing re-export statements. So if we take a look at this example, uh, we are importing button from the library and we are using button. Uh, our library, however, has like some entry point that's basically a list of export from statements exporting multiple, uh, like internal, like multiple functions, multiple utilities from other files. And this is actually very common in like in the ecosystem. Uh, and however, here we are executing button.js to tip.js form slash index.js. Uh, even if the only thing that we need is button. So we are executing a lot of unnecessary code. And so this solution I was proposing to this problem was to extend the deferred imports proposal to do something like, uh, to do something like this. So we would mark our exports with some keyword that could be the fair. Uh, the fair is the same keyword used for like the third imports. And this keyword will basically mean, hey, only execute this module if the, the file that is importing me actually needs it. So in this case, we are importing button from this library. So we only execute button.js to get button and we do not execute tooltip.js and form slash index.js. Uh, and actually, given that this is not a, like execute at startup or execute later switch, but it execute or not execute at all switch. Uh, because if I'm not importing tooltip, there is no way uh, some code could execute it later. 
Uh, so this is slightly different from import of error in this. Uh, and it brings its benefits. Uh, one is that we can, like if we, we can defer uh, loading this code at all, uh, assuming that we're fine with hiding early errors contained in these unused files. Uh, and so like in this case, we would only load this battle.js file. Uh, so this brings like great improvements, uh, like also on the web, well, the import of proposal is not as good uh, because it actually lets us save on network, network requests. Uh, so this is a very quick introduction to what this is. Uh, and it interacts in some ways, uh, well, we, it interacts with uh, like the various proposals to virtualize modules, uh, like the, the module constructor or the uh, virtual module sources proposal, because uh, ideally a virtual module source should uh, be able to represent this pattern. Uh, so a way I was thinking it could work, and it's also the way this would work at a spec level, uh, is that module sources or module records, if we talk about this, the spec constructs. Uh, so module records currently have a list of exported bindings uh, so that when linking them together, you know what bindings are exported from the module and you can like properly connect the various identifiers. Uh, a module record would also need to export a list of uh, like bindings exported from somewhere else in a, like with this deferred way. So the model record for component salary would need to basically say, oh, look, that's oh, terrible. Uh, okay, let's say there is also like a, another export, like const a equals two. The model record for this module would have a list of export of like normally exported bindings that contains A, and then a list of bindings, like the third exports from other files. Let's say, for example, there is button from button.js, there is two different from two uh, And when linking files together, uh, what the, the linker would do is that uh, it finds an import statement. Uh, so let's swap A here. So it starts, it loads component library, and recursively loads components libraries uh, like non like classic dependencies. So in, in this case, it would only load component like this file on the right. It would not load button.js. Uh, but if there was, for example, an import a dependency, here a dependency would be loaded uh, normally, which is what already happens. Uh, then once this is loaded. Uh, app.js, uh, well, gets all the bindings from component library and it finds two types of bindings. One is A, uh, that is a normal binding, so it does what already, like what the link already does. And then it finds button. Button is represented as a binding exported from somewhere else. So then app.js needs to load that somewhere else. So this code would be equivalent to basically having two separate imports in the main file uh, doing this. So basically the, well, so basically the, like the fair exports get, uh, like the, the semantics of the deferred exports are equivalent to having it uh, moved to a normal import in the importer file. Uh, so the way this uh, would work is that when, so if we have the module loaders designed based on the current import hook, uh, when, when loading, when creating like a, if I have a module object uh, representing app.js, uh, this would call the import hook of app.js 
with the components library specifier. Uh, this import hook would return a module object representing component library. Uh, and the import hook of component library will be called uh, with a string a dependency uh, because like we are recursive loading. Uh, then okay, control gets yield back to app.js. Uh, and at this point, app.js sees that it needs to load button.js. Uh, and app.js needs to call the import hook. Like this is all like this will all be done at the at the like engine level because the engine that decides when to call import hook. But when like loading up to JS, it would need to go grab the import hook of component library, uh, calling it with the button JS string, uh, which, yeah, uh, I hope it's clear. Yeah. And if we have a design different from the import hook, uh, for example, there have been some discussion about uh, like having a some sort of link function uh, to like manually link uh, the module record to like given a, a module object a specifier and another module object to like eagerly say this dependency of this module should be then linked to this other module. Uh, I in that other design that would still work. Uh, but yeah, you have again to call the link function with button.js on this module so that when app.js needs to, to load the button.js file, it will need to check the dependencies that have been pre linked in components library uh, and grab button.js from there. So even if the semantics of all these are equivalent to having this import in app.js split into two imports, all the information should still be stored in the component library module record or module object. Uh, and from a virtual model source perspective, uh, well, virtual model sources will need to have like we need to have some some sort of field uh, saying like they would they already need some field to say these are all my imports and these are all my exports. Uh, they would need a third field. Uh, that's basically a list of objects uh, with two properties, like the, the name and the specifier for things that are export using this new syntax. Uh, because again, they're handled differently by normal exports because they're not handled internally by the module, but they're handled by the parent module, uh, with, which would still then call the load hooks of the of component library. Uh, are there any questions so far or observations? Uh, or I, have a bit? I can I can share my feedback at this point, I think. The uh first broadly about this proposal, I believe that the consensus among us at Agoric is that we like this proposal and we like this proposal possibly so much that if we could have this we would prefer it over having import defer because it this this proposal does not introduce any interesting um, concerns about the observability of execution on the stack for anything that is imported. All of these mod in this model modules execute at the top of the event loop um, consistently, and with import defer, you don't get that and if all of the same motivating use cases can be covered with export defer uh, by whatever color that shed is painted eventually, uh, I think that we would prefer to only have export defer. Um, as for module virtualization, um, I do not foresee any problems with this. There are some changes to the intersection semantics with other layers of the compartments proposal. One, I think that the most obvious is that the uh, bindings reflection proposal would need to reflect this difference in bindings, and that would be sufficient to make it possible for a user space loader to emulate any host loader. Um, and interestingly, if that if the new introdu inter newly introduced export binding shape, by by, by way of uh, context, the proposal for bindings reflection 
that our friends at Modable uh, proposed to us for the compartment proposal uh, reflects bindings differently than they are captured in the current internal module record. Um, the which is to say that we would need a change in the reflection uh, in the internal representation in the static in in the module record as it stands today anyway. Um, the the folks at Modable discovered that it was uh, necessary to capture the order in which each of the bindings were introduced. So import X, import Y, import names from basically every every import syntactic form had a corresponding shape for its reflection and the and the reflection was an array of such bindings in the order they appeared in the source um with that a user space loader is in a position to observe uh, in, in order to correctly traverse uh in, in order to cor correctly uh perform the topological sort of the dependencies to execute them in the, in the correct order um yeah those are our high level impressions okay thanks uh, regarding use case covered by this versus import affair uh like the the driving principle is like improving startup performance for applications uh but like this export affair and import affair don't really overlap in which you would either use one or the other uh, because like one is about code that's not used at all uh, and it is currently being loaded, while import defer is about just mm -hmm. deferring execution. Yeah, import defer covers the use case where you have conditional execution of something that was unconditionally loaded. Yeah. Whereas this is, uh, this is providing a different facility. That is to say, um, not even loading things unless they are statically dependent upon. Yeah. Uh, and I have one specific question uh, regarding how this interact with like uh, how this import affair and export affair would interact or like what would be the semantics of the affair. As you mentioned that this is nice because it doesn't change the fact that modules are always executed at the uh, top of the call stack. Uh, I had some slides about how like showing the difference between the two. Uh, like for example, have this one with import defer and the normal export from, uh, and like you can see that uh, depth is executed. Mod.js, depth and the bar, no, Mod.js and depth are executed later. Uh, well, I guess this is wrong. This is also later. Uh, for and like later here means that they're executed when I call use when I use a dot foo. And so this has the, the property mentioned that it might not be at the top of the call of the execution stack anymore. Uh, and then I had this example and this everything is with this set up. So yes, everything here has a clean call stack. Uh, this is a com like a, uh, let's say normal import with a deferred export. Uh, then we have, let me first go to the next one. Then we have import defer used together with export defer. Uh, and in this case, the idea was that merging, uh, like when these two proposals interact together, when I have to evaluate a.foo, uh, uh, well, I obviously have to evaluate mod.js uh, because here I'm getting an export from mod.js. Uh, but when it comes to dependencies of mod.js, uh, an idea was that this would only execute foo and not bar, uh, because like this keyword here is basically splitting control for two modules. And so I can say, okay, that bar is not actually needed for, for mod.js, uh, it's deferred, so this only executes foo. Uh, and then if we go to import star and export, the fair. Uh, let me actually write the fair here. Okay. Uh, like an idea here was that uh, this is an eager import. So mod.js is executed eagerly. So if I have a console log hi, this is executed eagerly. Uh, but given that the 
full export is deferred, uh, we could defer the execution of the full until we actually access it on namespace. Uh, and like this is like semantically similar to what import defer does. Uh, and but this would mean that this export defer would still make it possible for depthful to be executed, not at the top level of the ex execution stack. Uh, um, I, I would need to study this much more closely to evaluate all of the intersection semantics between import and export defer, but the high level invariant that must be preserved is that uh, evaluating a lexical variable must not cause execution on the stack of another module. Yes, so this, like this, uh, like in, uh, in this case, uh, foo would still be executed at startup because we're using a, like a destructuring import. And so we do not want accessing the variable foo to have set effects. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, we're using a space import. So the access to foo is gated by property access. Yep. And so this is where we could still defer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a, a concern and this is not, this is not a, 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 a blocking concern. It's just, it's just something I, I, I'd be worried about. And, and that is the semantics here are uh, subtle. And I'm always nervous about giving users features where they have a choice of, of how to do things and the distinction between, you know, one branch of that choice tree and the other is subtle because um, that introduces opportunities for, for people to develop, uh, you know, sort of cargo cult practices because they don't understand it. So they just always use, you know, a particular feature or always avoid using a particular feature. And this, this feels like the kind of thing that is motivated by um, people, you know, by, by use cases where you have some large uh, performance consideration, like when you've got, you know, uh, a big a big package of libraries, some of which you're going to use and most of which you're not, but you'd like to package it as a single import. Um, and it's just, it's just more of an ergonomic concern. I'm not sure there's anything that you can even actually do about it, but I'm, I, that just kind of lingers there in the back of my head is, eh, okay, you know, are people going to get in trouble with this? My uh, to my response to this, and Nicolo, you should respond as well, of course, is that uh, the ship sailed for simplicity in the module loader ten years ago. Um, that's that's a fair point. Uh, like I say, I wouldn't I wouldn't raise this as any kind of blocking concern. It's just if there was something, and I have I haven't the first clue uh, what that something might be if it even exists. Oh, um, I do. I mean, I do. It's basically to dump ESM and instead of ESM, because it's clearly on a path to failure, <laughs> which I'm not sure, <laughs> um, would be uh, to propose a completely different module system that's actually simple, um, where import is just a function call, effectively, that is statically analyzable and synchronous and behaves behaves like common JS, except that is actually statically analyzable um, and returns a single value. And that value can be destructured. And there's also dynamic import, which is syntactically distinct in almost the same ways. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what I proposed in 2010. Um, and it does have, and the features of that proposal would be that it would have a clear path of, a clear path of adoption from common JS to, to this new module system. The behaviors would be almost identical. All of this, there would be feature parity between the two, including the ability to defer execution until runtime. But uh, it's too late. 
Yeah, I, I bet something very similar to your sentence has been already said 10 years ago in some committee meeting. Uh, yeah, uh, for, for your concern, Chip, uh, is it like in general to this changing how imports and exports work or like specifically to the last uh, interaction I mentioned where like... It, it, it's not so much it, yeah. that, that it's changing how they work. It's that it's that you now have the option, you would now have the option of using or not using this keyword on any particular uh, export statement. And if if you don't have a clear mental model of what the consequences of that are, um, I could see getting into sort of, you know, sort of whack-a-mole debugging situation where everything seems to work except sometimes it doesn't based on what combination of things you've got. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously having subtle dependencies on evaluation order of the various uh, imports that are being loaded um, is always fraught with peril. Um, uh, but this feels like it introduces, you know, new ways for you to to be confused about that. And uh, like I say, it's I would not raise it as a blocking concern. I just raise it as a hmm, you know, I wonder if there's a way to improve that. <clears throat> yeah, I, yeah I, I guess one of the like driving assumptions with the design of this proposal is that most people write modules that do not depend on evolution order in practice. Uh, and so like in like the like 99% of cases, adding the fur doesn't risk causing problems. And like, especially when it comes to like these libraries that like export a lot of the same functions, those are usually all pure modules that doesn't really matter when you load them. Right, and, and, and so I could see you know, development shops instituting a policy of, you know, always use defer. Um, and I think, you know, things would work if you did that, um, which would raise the question of, okay, so why doesn't it just work that way all the time? Yeah, uh, I, I've actually had feedback from people that were involved in this uh, like yes, six saying, oh, I wish we did this since the beginning. Uh, I actually tried to read some of the documentation available available from that time. Uh, unfortunately, not every discussion was captured, uh, but I actually, it looks like this, nobody thought about this uh, 10 years ago, or at least it was not captured anywhere I could find it. Chris disagrees. Chris remembers something else. Uh, I have slides. That's all. <laughs> yeah. I just I just worry about things that work ninety nine percent of the time, um, because if something only works fifty percent of the time, people learn to uh, um, learn to 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 deal with it. And if it works hundred percent of the time, then they don't have anything to learn. But if it works ninety nine percent of the time, then they never learn. Yeah, same. I, I guess maybe it's similar to how like top level weight works almost always. But then we have a that's presentation a, that committee. A great, last that week. is a great analogy. Okay. Yeah, I, I understand. Thanks for for bringing this up. Uh, yeah. So uh, I have a question seven. for Nick. I have, oh. I have a question for um, Chip. Have you ever seen a large system that didn't have cases that people had to think about like it's it's unclear oh. to me how we could design for this goal of like oh for sure no for the, the thing you're is kind of the, getting at right this is a feature which is specifically uh uh motivated by the concerns of large systems um uh, and the kinds of kinds of issues that they tend to have at scale um and uh, my concern is 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 having this feature, which is designed to 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 benefit large systems, uh, being present um, when most of what people are doing aren't large systems, um, and and uh, you see what I'm saying? The, 
the point was that most JavaScript code that people develop does run into these issues because the ecosystem is the large system. Uh, uh, that's so I'm, I'm, that's what I'm asking point. is, is your concern satisfiable at all? Or is this just No, I'm not sure that it is. Always um, have we want to do anything I'm, at all in JavaScript. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I'm not sure. That's why I say I, I was very explicit. This is not a blocking concern. Um, um, it's just a point of nervousness. Um, and and in Chip's defense, it would have been possible. It would have been possible if we had gone down a different route to produce a system that solved these problems with a much more simple solution. But um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. So, like, just to uh, like for this topic, I would like. Uh, Chris, you said you need more time to think about the implication of this uh, like interaction between imports and deferred exports. Uh, so maybe we can come back to it at a future meeting. Uh, I just wanted to mention one last thing for this, that is that my motivation for this interaction semantics are that it's basically how it works if you use common JS nowadays. Uh, like if you have, there are some libraries that has have getters in common JS for re-exports, uh, and which means that right now, if you do import X and then do X dot button, uh, button like it's a deferred export that only gets executed when you access the property on the module that exports object. Yeah, a concrete example of this is uh, Ed.Nee's cryptography library, which brings in hashing algorithms, etc., on demand. Okay, uh, do we want to also cover the other topic I have on the agenda? Uh, but I would like for that one actually to wait uh, for a week when Mark can join the meeting. Um, for the benefits of myself and perhaps Philip, would you like to summarize? Uh, yes, uh, so... There was, uh, Philip and I presented, uh, let me get those slides. Uh, I have present. them open, I can share them if you like. Oh, okay, yes, thank you. Uh, all right. Yeah, but Philip and I presented sure that I can some, do that. <laughs> some um, changes to the, uh, to how uh, eval a new function currently uh, interact with the host to determine whether they're able or not to execute code. Uh, right now, there is a host hook uh, that the host calls, uh, that there is a host hook called by eval any function to basically ask the host, hey, uh, do you want, uh, am I allowed to execute code or no? Uh, and we proposed, uh, we actually presented twice uh, for this topic during the meeting. The first time we proposed changing this hook to receive the contents of the string that's been evaluated. Uh, and this is because when it comes to CSP uh, for code execution from inland handlers or from script tags, uh, you can specify hashes of trusted code that can be executed. Uh, and we were trying to extend this to eval. Uh, so uh, your CSP can say, allow eval, but only for uh, this specific code and this specific code and block everything else. Uh, there are some use cases for this, for example, using dot evaluate on shadow realms uh, or like syntax feature detection where you want to try catch around a eval or new function. Uh, so we, we got consensus on passing the string, uh, the source code to the host. Uh, but then while working the spec PR, we realized that actually, uh, well, for eval, it's easy because eval uh, just does, uh, like basically the first line in eval is checking if the argument is an object. If it is an object, it just returns it as it is. Uh, otherwise it calls the host hook. So at that point we have the string and we pass it to the host hook. For new function, it's more 
difficult uh, for two reasons. One is that new function dynamically constructs this source text by basically concatenating all the arguments. Uh, and second is that new function stringifies its arguments. Uh, so uh, to, let's say, work around the problem of the dynamically constructed, constructed text, uh, for now, we only pass this source to the host if new function has a single parameter uh, and we pass, pass that parameter. This is so that the, the JavaScript developer writing JavaScript code has the static string in its code, in their code, and they can like reasonably hash it and pass the hash in the uh, CSP uh, header uh, without having to think about how the host would uh, concatenate all these little strings to create a function source text. Uh, for the problem of how to get the string, so the the original uh, way we proposed this was that at the beginning of the new function call, uh, so right now the host hook call happens as the first thing in the new function call, uh, and then it stringifies the parameters and the body. So when the host hook is called, we don't have yet the body string. Uh, so here we had two options. One was to only pass the string, like the body, if it's already a string. So basically lighting a type of check. Uh, and the other option was to move the call to after stringifying the, the parameters in the body. Uh, yeah, so this. Uh, and in plenary, most people seem to prefer option two. Uh, weekly, but yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, weekly, uh, but still like a weak preference for option two. Uh, and, uh, m but before uh, giving consensus, Mark wanted to understand better the implications of this and how these interact with possible future extensions uh, to the spec to support trusted types. And trusted types are basically, uh, you have a capability object that has the capability of uh, grants the ability to execute code. Uh, so with this trusted type thing, you can create an object that represents a string, but is the string marked as trusted. So a string that can be executed, even if you're disallowing execution in general. Uh, and trusted types are implemented at the, at the HTML level. Uh, they're not an ECMA 262 concept, uh, but the hook, like the, the eval and new function in 262 need to be adapted to also work with these objects. So for, uh, and the way this would work is that you pass not only the string, but also the object to the host uh, asking, hey, is this pair, like, can I execute this pair? Or maybe you would pass the object to the host and then the object, uh, the host can like either throw or return the string, uh, like represented by this trusted type object. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the way, there is already an open request uh, extending ECMA 262 to support trusted types. Uh, that request has, again, problems when it comes to new function uh, because of this complexity new function brings. Uh, that request right now, actually, let me check exactly what it does. Uh, that request has been opened four years ago. Yeah, I think it is. Um, it doesn't move the uh, like. It, it doesn't take the option to uh, moving the point in the algorithm at which uh, the parameters and body are stringified. Yeah, uh, actually, I'm reading pull request now. It's one four nine eight, and what this pull request does is that it moves. It uh, so this pull request. If there are, other than the body, um, this request, oh, wait a second. Yeah, this request 
doesn't move the when the host took is called uh, and instead just passes the body argument uh, regardless whether it's a string or an object it passes the body argument as is to the host uh, yeah and that's that's incorrect in any case because the uh, the parameters arguments could have executable code in them yeah, so it's only validating the capability of one of the arguments and not all of them. Uh, and also one problem with this is that it still uh, like it checks the object, but then it still delegates to the two strict method on that object. Uh, And I guess like if you, for example, replace the prototype, you could like override that to string. So that request needs to be reworked. Uh, we're not actively working on it, but like uh, we still need to make sure that trusted types can work all software or refactor. So the idea uh, we had was that uh, regardless of which of these two paths we take, uh, to then extend this to work with trusted types, uh, every time we could pass both the the body string uh, and like together with the body string, the object itself, uh, so that the 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 well HTML has uh, both the option to validate whether something can be executed or not, depending on the string itself. Uh, or on the object, so I can check internal slots of the object. Uh, so I think, like, I'm pretty confident that whether we go with option one or option two doesn't change how we would interact with trusted types. Uh, I guess the difference that with option one, in some cases, like with option one, when we're dealing with a trusted type object, uh, the, the body is not a string, so we would only pass the trusted type object. Uh, while with option two, we do pass both the object and uh, the string corresponding to the object. Uh, but I'm quite confident that in both cases, uh, it, like, it can still work. Uh, option two has the uh, unfortunate effect of being an observable change uh, because right now if your uh, CSP disables uh, execution, so if it disables new function, it would throw immediately. Well, with this change, it would first stringify the arguments of new function and then throw. Uh, so maybe option two is slightly more risky, uh, but in practice it's uh, like incredibly unlikely that somebody is depending on this order. Well, I think the difference between option one and option two in how we would interact with trusted types is that with option one, um, you'd have to pass the trusted types object and let the host hook return the string to evaluate um, because ECMA 262 wouldn't know about the internal slots of the trusted types object. Uh, whereas with option two, you'd have you you could pass the stringified body and the trusted types object, and then the the host hook could just block the evaluation if the two didn't match. And that's doing an equality uh, check on the string and the string captured by the trusted type. That's right. Yeah, that's a good point that like with option two, the host can like, can actually assert that the string is the string uh, that's contained by the trusted type object. Well, in any case, I think that this has been a great summary. I will, uh, I'll let Mark know that it's been recorded. Um, okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. I will be joining this meeting also next week. Uh, so if we can then maybe discuss this again next week if Mark will be here. Mm -hmm. 
I, I right. can't make it next week, but I, I can catch up afterwards. All right. Thanks, folks. I think that that's a meeting. I'll uh, see you all next time. Okay.